today, planet Earth is still the only celestial body where we can be sure we have life on it. And this life is a miracle in a way. Humans cannot make life uh, themselves, cannot invent life in a laboratory. Um, so when we try to understand life and its diversity, and we understand that the Earth is 4.5 billion years old, we just have to understand that this huge diversity that we see today in plants and animals and microbes is a characteristic of our planet. And it is a meaningful characteristic. It uh, provides us with a huge set of functions, oxygen that we breathe, uh, what we eat, the various bioproducts, but just uh, a sense for, for life in itself and how life can adapt to a changing environment is, uh, is beautiful to think about that. Well, first, um, I'm thriving for a deeper understanding. So already as a kid, I was so curious about how the Earth and the oceans function or how people function and why things the, are the way they are. So to me, um, curiosity is actually the, the, the greatest force in, in my being and in my work that I do. But uh, inspiration, yes, it, is, it has to do with uh, wanting to get a fuller picture, wanting to be close to the, the landscapes, the nature I love, which happens to be the deep sea and the oceans. And it's to me an inspiration to dive into a situation where most of my surroundings are unknown. I don't feel this as a threat. I feel this as a great uh, luck and a great situation when you know I'm taking a step into something that is not predictable for me, that, there, that is unknown. And then step by step, being part of it, becoming part of it, um, I love that in my work, but also in my private life. So we know that uh, there are fewer humans that have been diving to the deep sea than humans that flew to space. And that's amazing to think, wow, I'm one of them. I'm one of those people who under try to understand and explore the deep sea. So those moments of diving are fantastic, but of course also working with robots because with every dive, with every look you take to the deep sea, you are seeing something, you're observing something that no one has seen before. And discovery just feels great. So a dive uh, in a submersible starts with you entering the submersible and then you are put uh, overboard. And so this first moment when you go in, you're well prepared, you know exactly what the dive uh, has to do, what samples you have to get, you have a book and a computer to enter whatever you see. But then first it feels very uncomfortable. It is uh, quite warm inside, it is uh, a bit sticky and the waves move you around. And then you're very happy when you sink, when you start sinking first to 50 meters, that's when all the technical checks happen. Is everything uh, watertight and uh, is everything good with the gases? And uh, then it's very calm. And still you see the blue water and there are already the first fish coming by. You look outside of the window and then you see there is life around you. And then comes my favorite moment when you sink down to the depths. You are basically sinking out of the sunlit zone. And so you're, you're sinking through all blue colors, all color co uh, um, of, of blue to black that you can imagine. And once it becomes perfectly black, so when the photons um, are no longer there in this zone, then you encounter all of the fantastic deep sea life that has their own light, bioluminescence. And that's my favorite, my super favorite part of a dive, because when you then turn the lights off, you can see that, that uh, shimmering life around you and um, you sink further. And when you are at two, three kilometer steps, then it, the water is entirely clear. There are almost no particles. And you can encounter some of these large squids or some very weird deep sea fish. And then you, you come close to the seafloor. And uh, at the seafloor, there is again a lot of life. So when you then turn on the light and you see the seafloor, you see all the traces of life and you, you feel, okay, now you're here. The sampling starts or the observations start. And then you count the time that you have. It's always too short. Such dives are usually no longer than six to eight hours. You have some two, three hours at the seafloor before you start rising again. And this time goes by far too fast because you want, first you want to look only and take all the time to look outside of the window, but you have to, to solve tasks, you have to describe and sample and give check, checkups back to the ship and those kinds of things. So it's always going far too fast. 
Very early on when I was a student, I was uh, invited to participate in a deep sea mission that really changed my life and my career because uh, once I was out there at sea and once I was able to see the seafloor with my own eyes kilometers deep into the ocean and discover the strangeness uh, of life and different deep sea landscapes, then I was uh, absolutely convinced this is my profession, this will be my profession to just uh, understand this part of Earth that us humans normally do not connect with. But early on, um, when I worked uh, in research, I found out that our work as marine researchers is much more than just describing and exploring. In fact, we see traces everywhere already then. It's now 30 years ago that I started out as a student. We see traces of us humans everywhere, be it the littering, be it the effects of climate change, be it the first experiments that we do to harvest metals from the deep sea. Uh, be it uh, remnants of fisheries uh, and tracks and traces of disturbances on the seafloor. There are so many changes that we humans brought to the oceans that I knew also my profession will not only be exploring and admiring nature and finding out unknown life and unknown processes, it will also be being an eyewitness to the changes we humans uh, do and also questions of solutions and questions of risks that I have to speak about uh, when it's about the relationship we have to our oceans and polar seas. So I started out with the whole question of calm cycles and fluxes on Earth when I was looking into the role of the oceans, how much the oceans take up from the carbon that is produced, some of it naturally by the algae floating atop, but some of it just by our human energy consumption. And uh, when I worked at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in uh, California, in La Jolla, I got uh, familiar with their long-term time series of CO2 in the atmosphere, where a scientist, uh, Keeling, uh, measures since the 60s um, CO2 emissions um, off of Hawaii. And so we, we are taught about this ever-increasing CO2 concentration in the atmosphere and the threat that this means for global warming because it's a climate gas. And to know that for all this time, my entire lifetime, so when I was born, scientists started warning governments about this fact. And today, it's ever on the increasing uh, path. We are, although we are talking so much about it, although we know so much how bad it is for humanity and nature as such, still CO2 emissions are increasing. I will never forget my first access to the Arctic, so close to the North Pole. When I still understand that this is an ocean with ice on top, sea ice that forms to coldness by cold um, temperatures. And so when I went there with the research vessel, I was so amazed that it is possible to go with a ship, an icebreaker through the ice, break it and move forward. And that you can also step uh, onto the ice and walk on it and just walk on the deep sea. I was just thinking deep sea all the time. And then I, I got to know sea ice as a habitat. And um, that was in 92. And uh, I was able to come back with the same ship and uh, new technologies in uh, 2012, which happened to be the time with the largest ice melt of today since the onset of observations. And I was in the exact same region during, as during my PhD thesis. And so I was able to sample again after 30 years, and I will be able to sample again now 10 years later. And what is uh, really shocking is that during my lifetime, our lifetime, lifetime, this whole region has changed amazingly fastly. It got so much warmer than the global average that the sea ice is very different from what I knew when I was a student. It is much thinner, it breaks much easier, it melts really fast in the summertime. It is much warmer in wintertime in the Arctic than it ever was. And to see how this affects every little bit of the Arctic, from the atmosphere to the deep sea, is um, really somehow hurtful because it means that just by our energy usage, we are changing really every place on Earth, uh, be it as remote as the North Pole region. So most people, when you ask them, they would say, I love the sea, I love being at the coast, I love the oceans, I want the whales to be protected, I want the penguins and the polar bears to be protected. And uh, very often it is hurtful to them to realize that everyone's doing this impacting the ocean already at the global scale. 
CO2 we've already mentioned or methane release, there are other parts that are more hidden. For example, our everyday use of disposable plastics, that leaves a big impact on the oceans because the oceans take in uh, materials that are transported by the wind, they take into the precipitation, uh, micro and nanoplastics. And so the way we use um, plastics just means that the ocean gets a buckload of all of that. Another hidden factor of our life is uh, agriculture. So agriculture happens on land, but the, the um, nutrients that we put onto the fields, the fertilizers, they eventually through rain and rivers make it into the ocean. So the seas around us getting far too many nutrients. We have impacted the nitrogen cycle as humans more than even the carbon cycle. And that changes the seas, the health of the seas and coasts that can cause toxic algae and that can cause degradation of environments. So the list of how we all in our everyday life impact the oceans is unfortunately quite long. And uh, it seems like we don't have a choice. It feels like no one can directly influence um, with their own behavior the fate of the oceans. That then means it is up for a political solution. We need other rules, other ways of uh, getting to our nutrition, other ways of using materials, other ways of using energy. I'm not so clear. I try myself to find out whether some of the uh, faulty behavior that we have uh, towards nature comes from having lost contact or having lost a uh, deep uh, bond uh, to nature. But then I realize how much people rely on nature to improve their situation, to feel good, uh, to, to have a smell they love or to, to calm down from a hectic job. Um, and most people, if you ask them, they will perfectly well describe how much they love nature, how much they love oceans, but it's just not enough. So the predictions that we have for 2100 is that uh, this is the time when we have lost 99% of our coral reefs due to bleaching, due to a too warm ocean. It's the time when we have a summerly ice-free uh, Arctic and wh where we may have lost uh, a large amount of glacial mass also from West Antarctica a time when the uh, climate change threats or the destruction of species and habitats may have become so large that our health and also other uh, uh, factors have uh, decreased again. So the hope for me is that what we are already experiencing now, the combination of knowledge, technical and social solutions, and the feeling of the crisis that is already here mobilizes our energies um, and brings us together as humanity and uh, lets us act uh, for a better future. That's, that's the hope that I have.